Praise the Lord. Amen. What a song and what a service, what a message, what a Savior. It's great to be in the Lord's house tonight. And I appreciate this opportunity and I've so loved over the years being a part of this great Bible conference. Thank you very much for the privilege. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles tonight and turn with me in the Old Testament to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. And I'm going to begin to read in verse 19. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 19. And tonight I'm preaching on this subject, the fourth man in the fire. The fourth man in the fire. The book of Daniel chapter 3 and verse 19. The Bible says then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he arose in haste and spoke saying to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true old king. He said, look, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they're not hurt and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Dear God, put your words in my mouth and your thoughts in my mind. Lord Jesus, I must decrease and you must increase. Lord, I pray that you would grant to me tonight what I cannot borrow, what I cannot buy, what I do not deserve. I ask tonight for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that I might preach as a dying man to a dying world. Oh God, give our hearts ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to us. God, I confess the devil's defeated foe and that Jesus is Lord of all, for it's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord. Amen. Let me tell you how these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, got in this pickle, how they got in this predicament. These three young men were captured by the forces of Nebuchadnezzar when they invaded, when Babylon invaded the Holy Land, leveled the city of Jerusalem, these three young men that had grown up in the shadow of Jerusalem near the temple of God were taken as captives, trophies of war, back to the idol-worshiping city of Babylon. Now, Nebuchadnezzar did everything he could to pressure them into becoming Babylonians. He changed their names to reflect heathen deities. He put them in his university so that they would think like the world and think like a Babylonian. He wanted to change the way they looked at life, their worldview. He even sought to control, to manage and change their appetites by dictating their diets. And yet they refused his pressure. They stood firm against the current of worldliness that was coming like a flood tide against them. And then in the third chapter of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar constructed an image of gold of himself that was some 90 feet tall. And a decree went out to the kingdom that when the music began to play, that everyone in that kingdom, from the highest government official to the lowest peasants, had to bow down on their knees and worship that golden image. And if you didn't worship the golden image, then you would be cast into a fiery furnace. 
Now, I want to say as believers, we spend our life swimming upstream. We spend our life going against the flow. We spend our life resisting the pressure of Satan. And it's unrelenting. It's always going to be there. When you are on the narrow road, you are going against the flow. And Satan does everything he can to defeat you, to discourage you, to derail you, and to destroy you. And yet, when the music began to play and the people began to fall on their knees, there was an unusual sight. There was a vast multitude, thousands of people on their knees, worshiping that golden image. But there were three young men that were standing tall, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were arrested, confronted by the king, they refused to give in, and they were cast in to the fire. I want to show you the three things that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found in the fiery furnace. First of all, they found faith. Someone has said a faith that can't be tested, can't be trusted. Someone has said, where there is grace, there is godliness. And where there is faith, there is fruit. You see, there is what James calls a dead faith. So there is a difference between real faith, between a strong faith, a spiritual faith, and a fake faith. These young men had a real, genuine faith in God. Now that's amazing. They're young, probably older teenagers. They're away from home. They have tremendous pressure. No one to stand up for them or to stand with them. And yet these three young men away from home and the influence of their parents refused to bow before the heathen altar of false worship to a false God. Where on earth did they get this faith? Well, I want you to notice this tremendous confession of faith they had. It says in the book of Daniel chapter three and verse 17, they say to King Nebuchadnezzar, if this is the case that you're going to throw us in the fiery furnace, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But here's the faith. That wasn't their confession of faith. Here's their confession of faith. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. In other words, even if you throw us in the fire, we're going to keep loving God. We're going to keep trusting God. We're going to keep praising God. We're not going to doubt God. Our faith is going to stay firm even in the fire. Where did they get such a faith? Well, you see in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Bible says that God told Moses, I'm giving you my word, and I want you to tell my people to put that word in their heart. And I want them to do with this with that word. I want them to take this word, and I want them to teach this word to their children. I want them to teach it to the children when they get up in the morning. I want them to teach it to the children when they're sitting around the house. I want them to teach it to the children when they lay down to go to sleep at night, when they walk in the way. I want them to pour the Word of God into their children. You see, the children are not supposed to lead the parents. The parents are supposed to lead the children. And the greatest investment you can make in your kids is to give them the Word of God. But you can't teach the Word of God unless you believe the Word of God. You can't teach the Word of God unless you practice the Word of God. You can't teach the Word of God unless you are applying the Word of God. 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And after they had poured the word of God into their children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they experienced a true conversion before a holy God. They had a faith that would not waver because real faith does not fizzle out under persecution. It thrives. It does not merely survive. They went over there with faith in their heart. And when the king of the end entire nation threatened them those three young men stood up and said basically we're not interested in man's approval we're not interested in a popularity contest we're interested in giving glory to the living God and we're going to stand in faith for the glory of the Lord they found in the fiery furnace that their faith was real and you know, in the life of our church, this has really been a tough year. We have had so many wonderful people who have gone to be with the Lord. And I remember just the other night, a young man that I've mentored, he went off to Scarborough College at Southwestern. He's so gifted. He called me and said, Pastor, I'm at the hospital. Uh, somebody dropped my 20-year-old brother off, and, and he was already dead when they dropped him off at the hospital. And so we did that funeral. And then our, our, our pastor of singles, his 30-year-old son, died of cancer. And uh, when I was standing with Bob and Kathy, and we were getting ready to go in for the funeral service, and they were just standing there weeping, I was just saying, man, I, I don't know what to say to you. And one of my wife's dearest friends in our church died suddenly and then one of our faithful secretaries been with us for many many years her husband just dropped dead at home you know there's a lot of heartache and there's a lot of grief and there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of brokenness but this is what i saw in the lives of all these people i'm talking about i saw these people in their grief I saw these people in their difficulty. I saw these people in their adversity stand firm and say God is good all the time. God is good. And I told them on more than one occasion that one of the greatest testimonies that there is a God is a believer who in the midst of the fire does not deny the goodness of God but praises the goodness of God and these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, did not look at their adversity as a punishment or even something to destroy them. They looked at it as an opportunity to demonstrate and to testify of their true faith in God. So they found faith in the fiery furnace. But I'll tell you the second blessing they found in the fiery furnace, they found freedom. Now I want you to notice that they were thrown into the fire bound. It says that over and over again. It says in verse 20 that uh, the army, these, these men of valor were gonna bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It says in verse 21, these, these men were bound. And, and, it, and it goes on and it says in verse 24, weren't these three men bound in the midst of the fire? So they tied them up. And yet the king looks down and he says, I see that these men are loose. Now I want you to think about this. The fire that was intended to hurt them set them free. The only thing the fire touched on their body was the ropes that bound them up. And what you find in the fire is a holy God sets you free. Because when you're in the fire, you are going to turn to the living God because you understand that idols, things, stuff have no help when you are in the heat. When you are in the fire, you will be loosed from bitterness. Let me tell you something. You hold on to that grudge. You got hate. You got anger in your heart. And when you get into the midst of that fire, you realize that life is short. You realize the depth of what God's trying to do in your life. And you realize 
that you need to let it go and not spend your whole life sold up and mad with a chip on your shoulder and your feeling on your sleeves. Let me tell you something about the fire. It'll free you of unbelief. It will set you free. I think it's interesting that when Satan comes against us to hurt us, the difficulty he puts on us, God takes it and he uses it to mold us and to make us into the image of Christ and to deliver us into victory throughout our experience of fire. But notice this, not only are they loosed, the Bible says they're walking. He says, I, I see these guys walking. Now notice they didn't run from the fire and they didn't try to climb out of the fire. But the Bible says they walked in the fire. Now, fire speaks of progress, and it speaks of growth. And the greatest growth I've had in my Christian life have been during times of difficulty when I've been walking through the fire. 1989 was the toughest year of my life. I've been at North Jacksonville Baptist Church since 1991, but 1989 was tough. I was in a church I didn't fit, sort of a sophisticated church. I was driving them crazy. They were driving me crazy. In fact, one of the Sunday school classes, one of the folks in it told me that a little lady in the Sunday school class said, this young pastor is driving me nuts. He's giving me a nervous breakdown. Says, I have to go home every week and take a Valium after he preaches. Says, he's killing me. <laughs> Finally, one of the ladies in the class said, well, Honey, why don't you just get saved and you could enjoy church with the rest of us? And I, I, I had a physical issue. I had a physical issue and they put me on some medication that sort of took my appetite and I was in some discomfort and some pain. And my wife had told me that we shouldn't go to this church. And I had told her, you know, we ought to go to this church. And she said, well, you're the head of the house and I'll follow you. And every time Randy Travis came on the radio in those days singing, I told you so, she'd dart her eyes over at me. I thought, what are you looking at? <laughs> and I got into Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest. And I'm telling you, I've still got that little book where I marked it. And over and over and over and over again, he tells you not to run from trouble. He tells you that trouble is not your enemy. He tells you that difficulty is not there to destroy you. But God is engineering your circumstances and allowing the difficulty to come into your life to get everything out of you that doesn't look like Jesus and to put everything in you that looks like Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says they're walking and that speaks of progress and that speaks of growth and it speaks of joy and it speaks of peace. So they found faith. What a blessing to find in the fire that your faith is real and it's strong. They found freedom. Isn't it wonderful that through the difficult experiences of life, we get delivered from pride and ego and arrogance and self-sufficiency and grudges and bitterness and all of the other works of the flesh that quench the Holy Spirit and hold us back from experiencing God's best for our life. But they experienced one more blessing in the fiery furnace. They experienced the blessing of fellowship. Now, I love this part of the story in verse 25. It says, look, the king says, I see four men. Now, did we not throw three men in the fire? Yes, king, we, we threw three men in the fire. He says, well, I don't get this. He says, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. And they're not hurt. And that fourth one there, he looks like the Son of God. Now, I just want to say this right up front before we figure out who this fourth man is. They would have never fellowshiped with this fourth man if they had not been thrown into the fire. You see, it was in the fire where they found fellowship with this fourth man. Something special about this fourth man. 
something that brought joy to these three men. I believe these three men hated to leave the fire. I believe they were enjoying the fire. They were having church in the fire. They were having a worship service in the fire. They weren't restless. They weren't nervous. They weren't having an anxiety attack. They're just loose, walking around with this fourth man. Now, notice it says they're, they're, they're walking with this fourth man. So who is this fourth man? Well, this fourth man is given many titles and names in the Word of God. He is called the Ancient of Days. He is called the Lily of the Valley. He is called the Rose of Sharon. He is called the Rock of Ages. He is called the Alpha and the Omega. He is called the Advocate. He is called Author and Perfecter of our Faith. He's called the bread of life. He's called the son of man. He's called the son of God. He's called the chief cornerstone. He's called the good shepherd. He's called the great shepherd. He's called the chief shepherd. He's called the great high priest. He's called the great I am. He's called Emmanuel. He's called judge. He's called Lamb of God. He's called light of the world. He's called Lord of Lords. He's called King of Kings. He's called mediator. He's called Messiah. He's called mighty one. He's called Redeemer. He's called Savior. He's called Resurrection in Life. He's called Wonderful. He's called Counselor. He's called Mighty God. He's called Everlasting Father. He's called Prince of Peace. He always was. He always is. He always will be. He's unmoved. He's unchanged. He's undefeated, but he's never undone. He was bruised, but he brought us healing. He was pierced, but he eased our pain. He was dead, but he brought us life. He is risen, and he brings us power. He reigns, and he gives us peace. The world can't understand him. Fire could not burn him. Armies can't defeat him. Leaders can't ignore him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him. Herod couldn't kill him. The grave couldn't hold him. He's goodness, he's kindness, he's gentleness, he's God, who is the fourth man in the fire. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I want to tell you this tonight, if you didn't hear anything else I said, three men went in and three men came out. Jesus stayed behind so that when you get in the fire, he's already there to see you through the fire. <laughs>